and thank you to our audience for joining us for our session today. So in today's session, we will focus on how to produce and interpret the most commonly used visualizations for single cell RNA-seq data in Partech Flow. So everything you learned today will be helpful for you when it comes to analyzing single cell data. I'm gonna teach you how to discover cell types present in your sample, and I'll teach you how to generate figures for papers and posters and presentations and reports. The first topic we're going to discuss will be single cell QAQC visualizations. And then we're going to talk about dimensionality reduction with PCA and UMAP. We'll move on to talk about displaying the results of differential gene expression analyses with volcano plots. And then we'll talk about dot plots and violin plots as well. And if we have time, I'll finally discuss heat maps. Along the way, you'll also learn how to uh, use the various configuration options to customize the plots, how to save the plots, and how to export them as image files. The data set I'll be using to demonstrate these features will be a human PBMC sample from a healthy donor. This is a 10x genomics data set, although we support single cell data from any platform. Roughly 5,000 cells were screened in this sample. And these were cells from a single individual, uh, although we do support uh, multiple samples as well. And I got this data by downloading it from the 10x Genomics online repository. First, a quick introduction to Partech Flow. So Partech Flow is our solution for next generation sequencing and single cell data analysis. It's been designed to be very easy to use with a very nice graphical user interface. So you can do everything with a simple point and click action. Uh, there's no need to use the command line. It can be installed in the cloud on an HPC system or on a standalone server, so you can choose where to store your data. It's web-based software, so you can access it from any browser-enabled device, uh, so a laptop, a tablet, or even a smartphone. And it supports numerous types of data analysis, so RNA sequencing, um, uh, exome sequencing, microRNA sequencing, long long coding RNAs, chip seq, ATAC seq, metagenomics, and so on. And of course, today we will focus very much on uh, single cell RNA seq analysis. In addition to the data analysis features, there's lots of project management features you can help to you can use to help collaborate and share data with others. And also, you get access to all of our technical support and expertise. So with that, I'm gonna switch over to the software itself to begin the training session. So let's start with a quick tour of Partec Flow. So this is the homepage. So this is a list of different projects that me and my colleagues have been working on recently. If you ever get stuck in the software, you can always click your username in the top right corner. And there's lots of options here to give you help. So if you click on help, this will take you to our documentation site that Tanya just mentioned. And here you can search all of our user documentation using the search facility up here at the top, or you can click through to find specific topics that you're looking for. We also have step-by-step uh, -step tutorials with uh, demo data sets. Let's go back to Flow. We also have these handy how-to tutorial videos, which are quick tutorial videos on a specific topic. These are embedded into the software itself. So you can use this list on the left-hand side to find the specific topic that you want. So say if you wanted to learn more about how to import data, find the video on importing data, select it and push play, and you can watch a quick two-minute video to teach you how to import data. There's lots of other useful videos here on downloading data, exporting visualizations, that's relevant for what we're doing today, uh, there's a whole section on the data viewer, which is what we'll talk about um, uh, a lot throughout today. And there's a whole section on single cell RNA sequencing as well. And finally, you can contact technical support by going to contact us. And then you can fill out a support ticket on our website and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. You can also just send an email to support at partech.com and that's another way to, to reach out to us. 
So the first topic I want to talk about today then is uh, single cell QAQC. So let me go to a project that I prepared earlier. So in this project, I've already imported the data. This is my um, PBMC sample. And the data is represented by this circular data node. You can see it's a single cell counts data node. So an important first step in analyzing single cell RNA-seq data is to filter out low quality cells, for example, doublets or cells that may have become damaged during the cell isolation. So to perform single cell QAQC, you select your first data node. From the QAQC section on the right, choose the option for single cell QAQC. That will run a task, which shows up as a rectangular node here, and that contains the results of our single cell QAQC analysis. To open up that report, we can either double click or just click it once and go to task report from the menu on the right. So this will open up the single cell QAQC results in a data viewer session. So this is what the data viewer looks like. This is our way of um, visualizing, uh, presenting a lot of our visualizations. So at the center of the data viewer session, there is the canvas, which contains the plots. In this case, there's three plots. And there's all these cards on the left-hand side and the right-hand side that we'll use to configure these plots. To help you get started on the data viewer, if this is your first time looking at it, I'd recommend looking at the how-to videos uh, just to get familiar with the functionality. So we have three plots here. These are the most commonly used quality metrics for single cell RNA-seq data. We have the total UMI counts for each cell, total number of detected genes, and the percentage of mitochondrial counts. If the mitochondrial genes are missing from the count matrix or an annotation model wasn't specified during the sample import, this plot here in the bottom left, the mitochondrial counts will not show any useful information. We've got mitochondrial genes here, so we're seeing a, a useful plot here. So each blue dot in these uh, plots is a different single cell. You can see from the figure legend, there's roughly 5,000 cells. The cells are positioned along the y-axis according to their quality metric. The position along the x-axis is not so important. So let's start by configuring these plots so that we can see the patterns a little bit better. I'm gonna start on the left-hand side by first of all, removing the available plots card by clicking this button up here. And I'm gonna remove the data card as well because we don't need that right now. And that just leaves us with the configuration card. You can see the configuration card has lots of configuration options. I'm not gonna use all of these today, but if you want to try the software yourself, I'd encourage you to go through each one of these to understand how they all work. I'm gonna start off by selecting multiple plots. You can see I've got one plot selected, but I wanna configure all three plots. So I'm gonna hold control and select all three plots. So I've got three plots selected now. The first thing I wanna do is change the coloring to reduce the opacity. This makes the dots a bit more see-through, which can help us get a better idea of the density and an idea of how many dots are sitting on top of each other. This also reveals the violin plot underneath, which shows the shape of the distribution. The point where the violin plot is widest indicates uh, the point on the y-axis where most of the dots are located. So the highest frequency of dots is located around here. Next, it can be useful to scale these y-axes in a logarithmic scale to help spread out the data. So let's open the scale card and change the y scale from linear to logarithmic. See that just spreads out the data a bit more so you can see uh, the pattern. And finally, we can summarize the distribution by adding a box and whisker plot. So let's open the summary card and add box and whiskers. This shows the distribution in a bit more detail. We can see where the median is located and the respective quantiles, and of course the outliers. 
So these first two plots, the counts and the detected features, they're useful for filtering out doublets and non-informative cells. So let's take a closer look at the counts plot. I'm going to move it into full screen mode by clicking this icon up here. Maybe play with the configuration a bit, make it look a bit prettier. So for a lot of droplet-based technologies, it is possible that uh, you get two cells entering the same droplet, and then you end up tr sequencing the transcriptome of both cells. So these doublets will typically have a higher count than singlet cells, and usually a higher number of detected genes. So in other words, this part of the distribution, so the cells up here, are likely to be potential doublets. The lower part of the distribution here contain cells with a lower UMI count, which likely have uh, less information, so they're non-informative. If we look at the detected genes in more detail, so I'm going to move that to full screen mode, maybe configure it a bit. You can see there's a number of cells down here with a very low number of detected genes, so these are also non-informative cells. Let's move it back and exit full screen mode. The percentage of mitochondrial counts plot is useful for filtering out damaged or broken cells. So these cells typically have a higher percentage of mitochondrial counts compared to intact cells, although this can vary a bit depending on the type of tissue that you're working on. If you're working with a metabolically active tissue, something like kidney, for example, you might expect a higher percentage of mitochondrial counts. Uh, so this has to be taken in context. But for a PBMC sample like this, this means the cells in this part of the distribution are likely to be damaged or broken. We can apply filters by adjusting the selection thresholds in this card on the right. So I'm going to click my selection card to activate it. And you can see we've got three quality metrics here, uh, three selection rules on counts, detected genes, and mitochondrial counts. And we can type in hard filters into these boxes here, or we could use the slider um, to try and uh, exclude uh, the low quality cells. As we hover the mouse over each slider, we get a little histogram showing the shape of the distribution, which can also be helpful um, in filtering out the uh, low quality cells. So let's start by um, try to, trying to get rid of those doublets. So I'm going to filter based on my uh, counts. So I'm just going to use the slider to drag across down here. And you can see as I move the slider up and down, the cells on all three plots will be uh, selected or deselected accordingly. So these three plots are connected because they show the same cells. So I'm going to set the cutoff at around about there. That excludes these um, cells with a very unusually high uh, uh, UMI count. I'm going to round off that number to a, a much neater number. I'm going to call that 15,000. And I'm going to try and exclude some of these low expressed cells as well by setting a threshold of, let's say, 600. I want to remove these non informative cells down here as well. So let's um, use the slider to find a good cutoff. That looks reasonable. Let's round that off to 500. And then the number of detected features as well. Let's try and exclude a few more doublets. Set that to 4,000 maybe. That looks good. For my percentage of mitochondrial counts, we want that ideally to be as low as possible. So I'm going to set that to 10%. And you can see that roughly correlates with where my median is. So once you're happy with your set of uh, selection filters, this is a good time to save the date of your session. And you can do that by clicking the save icon on the left hand side. So let's give it a sensible name. I'm going to call it single cell, single cell QAQC. Click save. And this will firstly help us to remember the selection criteria that we used. And if we need to go back and redo the uh, filtering, we can do that very easily by opening up this the date of your session. So this, uh, by saving the session, we save all three plots and we save all their configuration settings. So that saves us having to redo all this configuration again the next time around. 
So once you're happy with your filters, we need to apply the selection criteria. So we've got our high quality cells selected. Let's come up to the filtering card now and filter to include these selected points using this icon here. And then to apply the filter, we need to click apply filter. This is asking us which data node we want to apply the filter to. So that we're going to use this data node, click select, and that will add a filtering task to our pipeline. So let's go back to the pipeline. I'm going to click the project name up at the top to go back. And as you can see, we've now added a new rectangular task node. And that will produce a new circular data node which contains our filtered high quality cells which are ready for downstream analysis. The data viewer session I saved earlier is stored under here. So if we go to the data viewer tab, this will save. This is where we store our saved data viewer sessions. So say I wanted to redo the single cell QAQC filtering, I can just open this back up again and pick up where I left off at the point at which I saved it. So this will remember all the plots with their configuration settings. And I could just readjust these if I wanted to, if I wanted to be more stringent, I could filter and then apply the new filter. So our ne next topic is dimensionality reduction, which includes PCA and UMAP. So I'm gonna to go to another project that I created earlier to save a bit of time. So let's leave this page. And this is another project with the same data. I've just spent a bit more time processing it with these additional steps in the pipeline. This is the same PBMC data set. So PCA and UMAP are commonly used visualization tools to display clusters of single cells that share similar transcriptomic profiles. They can be used to explore the data and to discover cell types present in your samples. So the first thing you need to do is clean the data. So you need to prepare the data. Uh, in this case, I filtered out the low express genes. That's this task here. And I normalized the counts to give myself normalized counts. Next, we need to reduce the dimensionality of the data using principal components analysis for a PCA. So that's this task here. And that gives me my PCA. We need to then assess the PCA results to decide the optimal number of principal components to use for the downstream steps. And finally, we can move on to do UMAP, which is the next task here, budding off the PCA node, uh, and that gives us our UMAP. I've also performed some graph-based clustering here, which is an unsupervised clustering method, which will come in handy later when we try to identify cell types. To save time, I've already run the PCA task, um, which you can do very easily by clicking your data node, opening exploratory analysis, and choosing PCA. So let's have a look at the PCA results. So I just double click that to open it in a new data viewer session. So we now have a 3D PCA plot shown on the canvas. So each dot here is a different single cell. You can see there's about 3000 cells that were included in our, in our filter. And the cells are clustered together based on how similar their expression profiles are. By default, this will open in 3D. If you wanna switch it to a 2D plot, you can click and drag the 2D scatter plot icon from the available plots onto the canvas. So I just left clicked 2D scatter plot and dragged it onto the canvas. If you wanna have multiple plots, you can drop the 2D scatter plot in relation to the 3D scatter plot, but I'm gonna replace it entirely to remove the 3D and replace it with the 2D. Then it'll ask you what data you want to use to draw your 2D scatter plot. In this case, it's PCA. So I've just typed in PCA to find my PCA data. Click PCA, and we now have a 2D scatter plot showing the first two principal components. 
To undo any actions in the date of your session, you can just click the undo button. So I'm going to click undo to go back to my 3D plot. So we need to assess the PCA results in order to decide the optimal number of principal components to use in downstream analysis. So to do this, we can use another kind of plot called a scree plot, which is over here on the left. So I'm going to replace this 3D scatter plot with a scree plot. So I'm just going to click and drag scree and drop it over here to replace my 3D scatter plot. The data I'm going to use to draw that um, scree plot is from my PCA data node. The scree plot shows the eigenvalues on the y-axis for each of the principal components on the x-axis. The higher the eigenvalue, the more variance that's explained by each principal component. Typically, after an, init an initial set of very highly informative principal components, the amount of variance explained by additional principal components is minimal. So you can see the, how the curve goes down. So by identifying the point where the scree plot levels off, you can choose the optimal number of principal components to use in downstream steps. So let's zoom into this section here where it looks like it levels off a bit. And as we hover the mouse over each principal component, we can see the amount of variance explained. And we can see how that goes down with each principal component. And just by eyeballing this data, it looks like there's not much more variance explained beyond around 20 principal components. So 20 looks like a reasonable cutoff for this data set. So let's go back. I'm going to click the project name up at the top. And we now know what settings to use for our downstream tasks. So to generate the UMAP, we just select our PCA data node. Go to exploratory analysis and select UMAP. When you're setting up a UMAP, you can choose the initialization method as either random or spectral. Spectral will give more accurate results, uh, but random is much faster, which is especially useful for very large data sets with a large number of cells. The default is set to random for uh, speed reasons. And this is where you can decide the number of principal components to include in the UMAP analysis. So we decided the optimal number was 20, but it can be useful to rerun this task to see the effect of using more or less principal components. I'm going to use the default settings, but you can click configure on the advanced options to change any of the advanced settings. For example, you can change the local neighborhood size and the distance metric that's used. To run the task, click Finish. I've already run the task, so I'm going to click back and then just show you the results. So let's go to our UMAP and double click to open it. So again, this is uh, similar to a PCA in that it's a 3D scatter plot. Uh, each dot is a different single cell and they are clustered together based on how similar their expression profiles are. Again, this is a 3D plot. You can change it to a 2D plot in exactly the same way I just showed you. So you can drag 2D over here and um, set the data to UMAP. I'm gonna work with it in 3D because it's a bit more useful. So it's a very interactive plot. You can zoom in and out with your mouse wheel. Because it's a 3D plot, we can rotate it around to get a better view. We can also zoom all the way in. If you can right click the mouse, you can then pan to move the plot around. The reset button is located here in the top right corner. So I'm gonna configure this data viewer session to help me try and discover cell types. So the first thing I wanna do is to add a table of my graph-based clustering results. So I'm gonna add a table. I'm gonna drag that over to the canvas and drop it below my UMAP plot. And I wanna add the results from my graph-based clustering. So I'm gonna search for my graph-based clusters, select my data, 
and I'll get a table showing my the results of my graph-based clustering. You can see here we've detected eight distinct clusters and we've also picked out the biomarkers. So these are the genes that are most highly expressed in each cluster and we can use these to try and infer the cell type each of these clusters corresponds to. Next, I want to project this graph-based cluster information onto the plot itself. So I want to color these cells based on their, the graph-based cluster number that they've been assigned to. So to do that, I'm going to go to my data card here, search for my graph-based clusters data, click it once, and I'll get this box that pops out. And that box has different sample attributes and features that I can use to configure this plot. I want to take the graph-based cluster assignments, so I'm going to take that attribute there, click and drag it onto the plot, and you'll see a bunch of different configuration options available that I can use this um, attribute to configure the plot with. So I'm going to use color in this case to color the cells based on the cluster number they've been assigned to. So you can see here there are eight graph-based clusters represented by different colors. The cells are colored based on which cluster they've been assigned to. So I'm going to use known marker genes to try and detect a few cell types. I'll do this quite briefly because I want to move on to other topics. This is just to show you. Um, but one handy way we can do this is first of all by duplicating this plot. So we can do that very easily by clicking this icon up here to duplicate the plot. That creates the perfect copy of the plot here. So it's another UMAP plot, which is exactly the same as the one on the left. I'm going to keep the one on the left uh, colored as uh, by graph-based cluster, and I'll use the one on the right to configure in different ways to discover different cell types. So I'm going to start by searching for monocytes, which I'd expect to see in my PBMC sample. So I want to color the cells based on their expression of a monocyte marker gene. So to do that, I'm going to come over to my data card again, and because I want to color based on normalized counts, I'm going to click on normalized counts. I get another one of these boxes with different attributes and um, features. I'm going to search for um, a gene. I'm going to use the CD14 gene. This is a common marker gene for monocytes. You can see it showing up here, and I can click and drag that onto the plot. I'm going to color the cells expressing the CD14 gene in green. You can see this population of cells up here is lighting up in green. You see from the, the figure legend, the cells in green show high expression for CD14. The cells in black show close to no expression for CD14. If we have a closer look at this population in our UMAP on the left, we can see that it's made up of graph-based clusters three and eight. So let's have a closer look at clusters three and eight in our biomarker table. We can see that they share quite a few genes as biomarkers, and a lot of these genes are other monocyte-related genes, so FCN1, uh, LYZ, and I see CD68 over here as well in cluster eight. So that adds extra evidence that these are likely to be monocytes. We can color the plots uh, by additional marker genes. So I'm going to drag the CD8 gene from the table over here onto my plot. I'm going to color the cells expressing this marker gene in red. So that changes our color scale here. The cells uh, expressing CD68 are now in red, and the cells expressing CD14 are in green. The cells expressing both marker genes are going to be in yellow. You can see most of these are yellow. So let's click on one. Yeah, you can see it. That's where it sits in our color scale. You can see it's showing positive expression for our two marker genes. So I'm pretty sure that these are monocytes now. So I'm going to switch to lasso mode to manually select them. So that's this one here. Select these cells and then classify the selection using the card on the right. And I'll call these monocytes. 
click Save. So another way to search for a cell type is to use a whole list of marker genes instead of just relying on one or two. So to do that, we can go to our coloring options down here. So let's reset everything here to clean it up a bit. So coming down to our configuration card, opening the coloring, first thing I need to do is change the data source for my color by uh, card. So I'm gonna change uh, to normalized counts because I want to color by gene expression. And this time I'll color by a feature list. And then from my drop down list here, I'm going to choose a list of marker genes associated with B cells. So we have a number of um, feature lists available that you can download uh, for common cell types. These are sets of marker genes for. Um, which are associated with particular cell types, or you could very easily add your own uh, list of marker genes. So I'm gonna choose a, mark, a set of marker genes for B cells. This is roughly 90 uh, marker genes. Oh, I selected the wrong plot, but never mind. Uh, so this plot over here is now select, uh, colored based on their total expression across that set of uh, 90 or so marker genes. So the cells lighting up in blue, have a high expression for um, these B cell marker genes. I'm going to undo that so I can see which graph based clusters uh, this population corresponds to. Here we go. So we can see that this cluster belongs to, uh, uh, sorry, this group of cells belongs to cluster seven and cluster six by the look of it. So let's have a closer look at those graph-based clusters. And yep, I'm seeing a whole bunch of marker genes associated with B cells, so CD79A, BANK1, and so on. So I'm pretty sure that these are B cells. So let's go to lasso mode again, select these cells manually, and classify the selection as B cells. reset. So now let's try and find some T cells here. So I'm going to go back to my biomarker table and just by scanning up and down I can see the CD3D gene lighting up in clusters 1 and 2 and also some other genes like uh, IL7R, uh, another T cell marker gene lighting up in cluster 4. Uh, and we can color this, this plot here by their expression for CD3D, let's say. So we can color those cells in blue. So yeah, it looks like it's pointing us towards this population here. So we can, uh, this time I'm gonna go to lasso mode and select these cells and then filter to uh, include just those selected cells. So this will rescale the axes uh, to give us better resolution. And by the look of it, it looks like this population of cells consists of clusters one and two, shown in blue and red, and then cluster four over here in green, and that confirms what I have saw in the table. And then we have cluster five over here, um, uh, which look like uh, possibly cytotoxic cells. If we look at cluster five in the biomarker table, I'm seeing lots of genes associated with cytotoxicity. NKG7, GNLY, and so on. So this time I'm going to select cells based on their graph-based cluster. So I'm going to go to my selection card. I'm going to change my data source for my selection card to my graph-based clusters. So then I can choose graph-based cluster here to add a selection rule. And I'm going to take cells from cluster one, two, and four see they're selected on the plots now, classify that selection as T cells. Click save. And then while I'm here, I'm gonna select cluster five, which is these purple cells up here and classify those as cytotoxic cells. So let's reset to go back 
and let's clear the filter by clicking clear filters. And I'm going to color this plot here based on our classification so far. And there you go. You can see that we've classified our cells as monocytes, B cells, and T cells, and, uh, and um, cytotoxic cells. I've been using UMAP, but you can use TSNE in exactly the same way that I just showed you. Uh, the next topic we're going to cover is the, looking at the results of differential gene expression analysis. So let's go back to the project up here. So after I applied these classifications in this project, let's take a look at the pipeline. You can see I applied the classifications and on my classif classification results, I performed differential gene expression analysis. And here I compared cytotoxic cells to T cells. So let's have a look at the results. So each row here in the table is a different gene. And for each gene, we get a p-value, an FDR uh, corrected p-value, the ratio, the fold change, and some other metrics. And these metrics indicate the significance of the differential expression between the cytotoxic cells and the T-cells for each individual gene. A nice way to summarize these results, you can see there's about 10,000 genes that were tested here is using a volcano plot. To display a volcano plot, you can click on this icon in the top right corner of the uh, feature list table. So for each comparison, you'll get a volcano plot up here. So if you click on that icon, it'll open up a new tab and it'll have a, a new data viewer session that contains a volcano plot. So on the x-axis, we have fold change values. On the y-axis, we have p-values. And each of the points represents a different gene. Uh, these genes over here, colored in red, are upregulated. They have positive fold change, and they fall above our significance threshold. And then these genes down here are downregulated, colored in green. And our non-significant genes are colored in gray. You can see there are a lot of genes up here with incredibly low p-values. Um, so that's something else to look out for. It tends to happen with single cell data. So again, I'm gonna use this panel on the left here to configure my plots and uh, to make it, to, just so we can see the pattern a bit better. So I'm gonna start by maybe making this x-axis a bit more symmetrical. So I'm gonna change the range and override the minimum and maximum values on the x-axis to make them roughly equal. So I'm gonna set that to minus 400 and plus 400. So you can see that's a bit more symmetrical now. We can get rid of some of these grid lines as well. Um, I'm gonna get rid of the minor grid line. So open the grid card. That looks a bit cleaner. We can change the coloring as well. You can see they're colored based on their significance at the moment. Um, red for upregulated, green for downregulated, uh, gray for non-significant. I'm gonna change the color for the down-regulated genes to say a blue. We can change the size of the dots if we want, and maybe even the opacity. Yeah, that looks a bit better. So we can play with the configure uh, the significance settings to see the effect of what would happen if we uh, increase or decrease the significance criteria. So to do that, uh, we can open the significance card on the left. And let's use a different fold change cutoff. Let's increase the stringency to uh, 10 in each direction, so plus or minus 10. And you can see that's moved these bold lines to the left and right. And that still gives me quite a few significantly differentially expressed genes. 
Right now, the y-axis is showing me p-value, but I can change that by going to the data card here and change the y-axis to show me FDR values, so false discovery rate values. So that's now showing FDR. And I can increase the threshold on the y-axis. Let's move it to something like 0 0.0001. So that's moved the y-axis threshold up. And to see the number of genes that would be included in this filter, I can mirror the significance coloring threshold in the selection criteria on the right. So let's activate my selection card. I'm not going to filter on p-value, so I'm going to remove that. I'm going to filter on FDR instead. So I choose that from the drop-down list. And I'll reset these filters here to mimic my significance criteria 0 0.00001 and you can see that would give me 181 differentially expressed genes okay so that's how you can um, configure the volcano plot for a publication uh, but also for uh, just exploring the um, effect of different significance thresholds I want to go back to the feature list now, so that's this tab here. Another way we can generate visualizations here is by looking at a dot plot or a violin plot for individual genes. So next to each gene, we've got this view column, and we have this these different icons here. So if you want to view a dot plot for an individual gene, you can click on this icon here. Again, another new data viewer session. And this time we have a, a dot plot. So each dot represents a different cell. Uh, they're organized on the x-axis according to their category of uh, cell type. And the y-axis shows the expression of NKG7 at the moment. We can configure this again using our configuration settings. I'm going to change the summary settings and convert it into a violin plot by adding violins we can overlay those violins onto the dots and we can actually make the violins colored as well i like to increase the jitter on the data so if you open the, the data card we can increase the jitter using this slider here and this just spreads the data out on the x-axis a bit more and again, you can change the opacity, the size, and so on. So that's how to display a dot or violin plot for an individual gene. If you want to display multiple genes, that's very easy to do. Once you've got uh, the plot configured for uh, just one gene, I'm actually going to remove the figure legend here as well by um, toggling the figure legend here. So once you've got this configured, um, as you like, you can duplicate the plot again using this icon up here. That will create a perfect copy. And I'm going to duplicate it a few times. You can keep going if you want to. And what you can do on the duplicate is swap out the y-axis for a different gene. So using the data card, we can change the gene that's displayed on the y-axis. I'm going to use uh, another gene, GNLY. The plot will update to show the expression of GNLY. For this uh, plot down here, let's use, I know, GZMB, maybe. Another cytotoxic mark gene. And then uh, we can use another gene here. This time, let's use I know, something like CD3D. And you can see that's highly expressed in T cells and cytotoxic cells. So that's a very nice way of creating a figure for uh, a paper. The other thing I wanted to mention here is uh, the other way to add and access a, a volcano plot um, is to actually just add it directly. So if you have a data viewer session open, you can go to come down to 2D scatter plot and click the down arrow here. And then you've got the option to add a volcano plot, which you can just click and drag onto the canvas. I'm going to replace this one, for example. Drop it here. 
choose your differential gene expression results and that will be used to draw the volcano plot which you can configure just like we did before. So you can create a nice paneled figure uh, for your papers or for a presentation. To export an individual image file, so if you want to save this dot plot, violin plot, as an image file, uh, you can do that very easily by clicking this icon up here, save image. And this will export the uh, image as an image file, either PNG, SVG, or PDF. You can configure the resolution, click save, and it will be exported through the web browser and downloaded to your local machine. So if you want to uh, get an image file for an individual plot, then click on that icon there. Uh, to export the entire canvas, so if you want to export all four of these images as a single image file, click on the save image icon on the left. And that works in exactly the same way. Okay, so finally, and very quickly, because I want to leave a bit of time for questions, uh, I want to talk about heat maps. So I'm going to go back to my project here. So heat maps tend to work best on a smaller number of genes. So it's usually a good idea to filter down to a subset of meaningful or interesting genes first. For example, here I filtered down to significantly differentially expressed genes. To run hierarchical clustering or heat map, you select your data node, go to exploratory analysis, and choose hierarchical clustering or heat map. It's usually better to cluster just on the features or the genes, and it's usually best to keep the, um, this option here uh, unchecked for single cell data. Uh, clustering on the cells uh, doesn't really work too well for single cell data because of the sparsity of the data. By leaving this unchecked, we can decide the order of the cells ourselves. You might want to apply filtering. For example, my comparison was between just the cytotoxic cells and T cells, so I just want the heat map to include those cells. So I can set a filtering rule to include if the cell type is cytotoxic cell or if the cell type is T cell. So that will exclude my B cells and monocytes. Because we've unchecked the cluster uh, samples option here, we can choose the ordering ourselves. I'm going to order the cells based on their cell type. I'm going to push my cytotoxic cells to the top just by clicking and dragging, and my T cells just below that. My B cells and monocytes are going to be excluded anyway. So you can configure your heat map however you want, click finish, and that task will take a few seconds to run and generate a heat map. So let's open that up. So this heat map shows the differentially expressed genes for all the cells. So each row is a different cell, each column is a different gene, and the colors represent the expression value of each, uh, of each gene in each cell. We need to use this uh, panel on the left here to configure the plot. So let's uh, play around with it a bit. I'm first of all going to change the coloring of the low expressed uh, genes to blue maybe. And I'm going to set the zero expressed genes to a paler color, something like white. And I'm going to change the thresholds here. I'm going to set the low threshold to something like 1.3, and then the high threshold for positively expressed genes to 1.2. That gives us better resolution. Let's add some labels based on cell type, maybe. So you can see our cytotoxic cells cluster here, and our T cells are here. And this is because we determine the order ourselves. You can even transpose the view if you prefer it the other way. So this button up here transposes heat map. I now need to rotate these labels. So I'm going to click on the gear icon here and set the rotation to zero. 
that gives me more sensible labels. And we zoomed out a bit too far to see any of these gene uh, labels. So I'm going to disable those labels because they're just taking up space. So this shows uh, this cluster of genes here is uh, down-regulated in cytotoxic cells, shown in blue, and up-regulated amongst uh, these T cells. Whereas this cluster of genes shows the opposite pattern. These are up-regulated in our cytotoxic cells and down-regulated in our T cells. So with that, I'm going to go back to my slides just for a few closing remarks. So in summary, I've taken you through how you can work with uh, single cell QAQC plots, UMAP and PCA. We talked about volcano plots, dot plots, violin plots, and we discussed heat maps at the very end. We have a whole bunch of other visualizations, which I haven't, which I didn't have time to show you today, but I want to show you very quickly. We have um, more QAQC plots on the cell barcode QAQC uh, to see if there's any empty droplets in your data. The feature distribution plot, where you can list all the genes and see which genes are most highly expressed in your cells overall. Other kinds of 2D scatter plot, uh, you can plot different um, cell level attributes against each other. You can plot different genes against each other. You can configure them to be bubble plots. You can even uh, uh, plot categorical variables against each other, like the one on the right. TSNE is also available. You can use that in a very similar way to, like I showed you with UMAP. Histograms and bar charts are also available, showing frequency distributions and number of cells in different groups. Profile plots are available, so if you have multiple samples, you can plot them on the x-axis, and then each line will represent a different gene. So you can plot the uh, expression profile of uh, each gene across multiple samples. This is great if you have uh, different time points, for example. You can track the gene expression profile of individual genes over your time points. More advanced things like trajectory analysis are also possible where you plot cells against a developmental trajectory. And more advanced things like integrating microscopy data, so you can have do things like spatial transcriptomics as well. This is just a reminder that we have you have access to technical support with every free trial and um, uh, with every license. Uh, so please feel free to reach out and contact us if you have if you ever have any questions.